dear colleagues and respected scholars, I welcome you to our second session in our workshop series on national Islams in the West. This workshop is hosted by the uh, German Center for Integration and Migration Studies, the DEZEM in Berlin, Germany. And today I am keen to introduce John Bowen to you. He is a professor at the Washington University and the director of Transatlantic, uh, the Transatlantic Forum there. He's a highly regarded academic, he's highly regarded academically and held uh, professorial positions at highly prestigious universities, including the Ecole des Hautes en Sciences Sociales, uh, London School of Economics, University of Amsterdam, uh, Howard University, and uh, at some point he was um, the director of research as the uh, CNRS. Bowen has worked in Muslim communities for decades now. Um, his interests revolve around comparative social studies of Islam, political theory and cultural pluralism, cultural uh, cultures of legal reasoning, religion and ritual, immigration, and he has done field work in countries such as Indonesia and countries in Southeast Asia, France, Britain, the Netherlands and Western Europe. Hence, his expertise today will be around um, the comparison of national Islams between Britain and France, um, processes of hybridization, and the national practices, differences and um, similarities. Um, this ties to our last um, session last week, where we had Hugo Micheron, who talked about the French Islam and uh, the Islamist threat. And next week, we will have Nadia Marzouki with her opus magnum about um, the American Islam. And hence, we are keeping the uh, continuity around uh, national Islams in the West and how they compare to each other. So without further ado, um, I give the stage to uh, John Bowen um, to maybe introduce himself um, other than what I said already and start the. Um... Thanks very much, Nader. Uh, now, I think you've done it and you've done it. You did a very good job introducing me. I, I don't really need to add anything. I think it's, it's interesting that Nadia and I are doing a sort of a, a, a crossing of countries and that she, based in France, is, is going to talk to you about Islam in the US. And, and myself, based in the US, I'm going to be talking about Europe. That's, uh, that's probably how it should be. We can have different perspectives from different places. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of set out a, a framework today and using, um, using France and Britain as, as the examples of, for the comparative study of Islam in Europe. And I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to call up uh, a PowerPoint so you'll, you'll only see me in a little tiny box in the upper right-hand corner, and I will, uh, I'll be sharing with you uh, some images as I Talk, which is much better than just seeing me all the time. And uh, someone will tell me if this isn't working, but I think it should be, yes, it should be fine. Okay. Um, so as you, as you see, as you can see, I've, I've entitled this Islamic Adaptations in Europe, and it fits in this series of three lectures that, we, that, that you're, you're, you're benefiting from. Uh, I, have a, I have an argument that really uh, makes adaptation central, that, that uh, Islamic public actors have adapted the texts and traditions of Islam to new settings, both in institutions they established and in the modes of Islamic reasoning that they favor. And that's the essence of what I work on, is the creation of institutions under, under very particular circumstances and how this then shapes styles of Islamic reason. Secondly, that these processes of adaptation lead to very different outcomes in each country and possibly across different regions of the country, such that it makes little sense to speak of European Islam and even less of a Western Islam. And now I'm going to see if I can make this work. There we go. Um, I think that these arguments are important to carry to two very different audiences. One is the general public from school children, policymakers, saturated as their channels are with alarming news about waves of Muslim refugees entering Europe and false news about an eventual takeover of Europe by Muslims. The other is the public that reads books and that in most Western countries is likely to find two alternative and broad frameworks for thinking about Muslims in the West, both of which you'll see I find insufficient. One, it, it, Islam is doctrine, for better or worse. In that framework, it's either a religion of peace or intrinsically bad. Debates on that issue often around, uh, turn around selective citing of scripture, kind of an essentialism of Islam. 
The other framework, which also I, I don't find very useful, is the thesis of a secularized European Islam insisting of Muslims as individuals driven by social and political conditions and susceptible to radicalization. In either case, is serious attention paid to ways in which Islamic public actors interpret their tradition in a specific national context, or to ways in which they adapt Islamic institutions to that context, or how these efforts intersect with projects of, say, local mayors who wish to support a mosque or not, or provide for halal slaughter or oppose it. As Muslim actors and other local actors deliberate and build, they're doing what, uh, what earlier religious minorities have done. For example, in the United States, Catholics and Jews. And you can think of other cases yourselves. I think these adaptive processes make strong contributions to successful religious pluralism because they facilitate majority acceptance of new groups as citizens worthy of cooperation and respect. I'll set out the argument by highlighting the contrast between the experiences in Britain and France. These experiences illustrate both the importance of these adaptive processes and the divergent trajectories of Islam in each European country. But the explanatory model I propose can be extended to other cases. You might want to do so uh, okay. regarding Germany in our, in our questions and answers. And indeed, I briefly make one such extension at the end of my talk to Norway. Let us also remind ourselves that Muslims have played a major role in Europe for centuries, in particular in the lands that formed part of the Ottoman Empire, and of course in Andalusia, that I focus here on immigration trajectory should not lead us to consider Muslims and Islam to be new to Europe. So here's the, here's the framework. It's that as, as Muslims have settled into relatively new settings, they've adapted in, in various ways. For example, learning a new language or having fewer children. But they've also created ways to learn, pray, eat, marry, and divorce, bury and resolve differences, resulting in mosques, schools, tribunals, halal inspection services, et cetera. I think that how they do so is shaped by the interaction of three broad factors or variables. First, migration trajectories, where people come from and where they settled. Secondly, opportunities and constraints, what is encouraged and what is discouraged in countries of new settlement. Thirdly, Islamic repertoires, what ideas and practices have Islamic public actors brought with them? By the way, this framework can be applied to other groups with appropriate changes, not, not only Muslims. I look here at Britain and France with a brief reference to a third case, Norway, and I invite discussion later of other cases. First, Britain. Britain's Muslims came to Britain primarily as workers, not as Muslims, during the great demand for workers in textile and steel industries, and also in smaller manufacturing centers and restaurants. These immigrants, largely from the former British Indian colonies, and thus members of the Commonwealth, were welcomed. But as they began to settle as, as, as families, Racism and nativism led many to decry the ties of non-English, meaning black, people. Economic downturn exacerbated these oppositions and both economic fears and racism continue to ha haunt Brexit and post-Brexit Great Britain. But they also find many in Britain who hold that Muslims have the same rights to arrange their lives in terms of their religion as do others. And here the three variables help us account for the forms these arrangements have taken. First of all, migration trajectories. More than anywhere else in Europe, I think, Muslims living in Britain today tend to live in neighborhoods with other Muslims who came from the same specific regions of their home countries. In their case, these other places were in Bangladesh, Pakistan, or India. And these Muslims are likely to use home country languages and to follow religious teachings of those places. The Mirpur district of Pakistani Kashmir accounts for many, probably most of the Pakistanis in Britain today, as does the Silhet district for Bangladeshis. As a consequence of chain migration practices, some streets or neighborhoods in the North or the Midlands or greater London, are the three areas you can see uh, in, in darker green on the map, uh, sorry, are made of people who share the same place of origin, religious preferences, and language. Children may grow up speaking only Punjabi until they enter school, for example. Families often try to arrange marriages between their Britain-born sons or daughters and close relatives back home. Over one half of Pakistani marriages conducted by people of Pakistani descent but born in the UK are with cousins, and over half are with spouses born in Pakistan. This pattern lies in striking contrast to that of most immigration trajectories around the world, where marriage quickly begins to broaden social linkages and to decrease marriages with 
potential spouses back home. So this is an unusual situation in, my, in terms of migration studies, this concentration effect in Britain. As a result, Britain has concentrated communities of Muslims in certain neighborhoods who have strong institutional foundations. Islamic institutions have therefore easily found strong local bases of support, even while also maintaining strong ties with homelands. In addition, scholars travel back and forth between schools or councils or other Islamic institutions in Bradford, Birmingham, or London, and their counterpart institutions in South Asia. The second variable is opportunities and constraints. Local organizing on the basis of ethnicity or religion is considered to be legitimate in Britain. In the 1970s, state aid was given to ethnic-based local organizations that lobbied with local school boards or councils to have halal food and Islamic content for religious curricula. By the late 1980s, it was more often mosque-based associations that did so, and all this fits into an English structure of opportunity. Things get done locally in Britain and by community action. Most judges and lawyers largely accept the idea that people might arrange matters on their own and generally refrain from issuing orders of things that family might be able, families might be able to sort out on their own. But they might sort things out on a religious basis merely adds a new religion to the list of those who can form state-funded religious schools, be registered to and conduct marriages in their places of worship, and form religious associations. Thus, legitimate visibility, a particularly British landscape. Let me give two examples. First, the East London Mosque. This serves as a religious, political, and cultural center for the Tower Hamlets area of East London. Bangladeshis settled there. The, the East London Mosque serves them and their concentrated population makes the East London Mosque possible. Although other buildings had served as mosques for decades, the new mosque that you see here was only constructed in 1985. Prince Charles led a subsequent campaign to build the London Muslim Center next door, which opened in 2004. The Miriam Center, for school facilities and women's prayer opened in 2013 with broad public support. The mosque has always been a focus for East London Bangladeshi activities. And this consistent tie has meant that it has had multiple affiliations and even more relationships as host to distinct but related organizations. Broadly speaking, the mosque has been the pole for Islam-based community organizing, which in the 1980s meant opposing the groups organized by Bangladeshi's Awami League. Right, so close ties between what happens at the mosque and what happens in Bangladesh. The mosque has also been a center for broader community activities, such as employment and healthcare. Local health services stage clinics and offer vaccinations at the mosque. A pro bono law service, staffed mainly by non-Muslims, interestingly, works out of the center, handling immigration and family law cases. The center houses many other organizations as well. A funeral service is located next door and works with the mosque. The Islamic Bank of Britain sits across the street. The mosque has served as a basis for the Islamic Forum Europe and the Young Muslim Organization, which link the East London Mosque to local politics and at the same time to global Islamic networks. The, the IFE aided George Galloway and his respect party for elections and in his opposition to, to the Iraq invasion, for example, and also helped politician Lutfur Rahman in his campaign to lead the Tower Hamlets Council. In 2010, became the first directly elected mayor of Tower Hamlets. He was re-elected in, re in 2014. To be a truly full service mosque in a British urban context means attending to death as well as to life. Muslims living in Tower Hamlets receive a council subsidy of 225 pounds per body because the borough does not yet have any Muslim burial sites. This extraordinary, extraordinarily feature of local political life allows the center to partner with a cemetery further east in, in Hainault, Ilford, where many Muslims now bury relatives. So, a visible and important center for Bangladesh and Islamic life, but is also a social and political actor with a great deal of legitimacy as such, firmly anchored in the local community. Now, a second example, divorcing at Sharia councils. South Asians also brought with them practices of resolving family disputes in local councils. And here enters my third variable, Islamic repertoires. British colonial policies of granting legal recognition to religious communities, together with post-colonial policies of adding ethnic and religious associations, of aiding, sorry, ethnic and religious associations, facilitated the emergence of Sharia councils. They resemble, and to some extent reproduce, India's Dar al-Qazas, private Islamic institutions first created in the 1920s in order to ensure Muslims' needs 
even if they became minorities in a Hindu dominated country. In Britain today, these councils give advice on a range of matters to those who seek it. They are known mainly for giving Muslim women Islamic divorces. An English divorce must be obtained through the legal system. In Islam, a man can initiate a divorce on his own, but women require a judge to dissolve the Islamic components of their marriage. And the councils do just that. These councils emerged in the 1980s in cities with high Muslim concentration. Today, Sharia councils exist in London, Birmingham, Bradford, Manchester, and elsewhere. I've spent many, many months attending sessions with clients, formal deliberations among scholars, and study in council archives. I work mainly in three such councils. They are very different kinds of institutions with distinct histories and missions, even if all three dissolve Islamic marriages. The first is a Sufi saint complex. Sufis make up the greatest number of Mus Muslims in Britain, and they tend to have the most visible mosques, such as the Gamkul Sharif Mosque in Birmingham which is an outpost of the Sufi center of the same name in South Asia. Again, that direct link between an institution in Britain and both its local community and its counterpart in South Asia. The tomb of the, of the only Muslim saint, the only Sufi saint to be buried in Western Europe, Muhammad Abdul Wahab Siddiqui, is located in the 184 acre Hijaz community in the Midlands. The community draws many visitors due to the presence of the shrine and that of the saint's son and successor, Aiza Akhtab Siddiqui. Aiz is also a barrister and is sought to include the mediation activities of his Muslim Ar Arbitration Tribunal, or MAT, within the community. That's the first example. Second is a council run by women. At the Birmingham Central Mosque, which you see here, a Sharia council grew out of a women's crisis center. That's very important. That was this, or, that was this genealogy. And women pay, play central roles in running the council welcoming clients, and discussing appropriate remedies. Finally, the third example is a court-like tribunal. The most prominent Sharia Council in Britain is the Islamic Sharia Council, London, about which I will say a bit more. The London Council has existed since 1982 as representatives in many large cities in Britain and accepts requests for services in its central London office. Islamic scholars hold regular open sessions in which Muslims may come to ask questions about their personal or professional lives, to seek mediation of disputes, or to seek an Islamic divorce, an act entirely separate from civil divorce. When the council deliberates in its monthly formal meeting, it focuses mainly on requests by wives to dissolve their Islamic marriages or the religious component of marriages registered in Britain. Most of the scholars come from South Asia and were educated in Deobandi schools or in other schools that follow the Hanafi Madhab. One scholar comes from Saudi Arabia, a very influential one. Several of them have studied in Medina and Riyadh. They bring together Hanafi, Salafi, and other viewpoints. The council publishes the procedures to be followed in these cases on its website, and it can track the progress of any particular case on its computer database. Currently, it logs about 600 cases each year. A wife may approach a scholar in the council and ask for her marriage to be dissolved. They ask for divorce for many reasons. In an 85 case sample of cases, most women mention a breakdown in the marriage because of irreconcilable differences, separation or desertion. Many also emphasize violence and abuse and some claim the marriage was fraudulent or coerced. Most of the women and the men to come before the council in the past four years were born in Pakistan or Bangladesh or are of South Asian ancestry. Somalia provides the next largest category of petitioners. A modal woman, kind of representative example, to use the council, lives in Britain, is a British, a British citizen of Pakistani or Bangladeshi origin by birth or by ancestry, and requests divorce from a man who was born abroad and might still live abroad. In a considerable number of these cases, a woman living in the UK travels to Pakistan and Bangladesh and there marries a local man, whether on her initiative or on that of members of her family. So th this, is, this is the bulk of the cases that come before this council. In nearly all cases where the petitioning wife meets the procedural requirements set by the council, she receives a divorce. This is especially the case if she's obtained a civil divorce already. So the council basically says, she's already divorced legally, let's just go ahead and, and free her so she, can get on, so she can get on with her life. The divorce is said to be a hula, where the wife forgoes or repays the mahar the marriage gift to the wife. Mahar can be small or large. Often the arguments at the council concern the mahar, this, this marriage gift. 
how do these procedures intersect those of civil law? This is the key question faced in Britain today. The council grants an Islamic divorce. They insist that a woman who married overseas or who registered her marriage in Britain ob obtain a civil divorce as well. Although members of the council may give advice about Islamic law on a range of matters, they do not pronounce on child custody or on the division of assets because they know full well that if either party is dissatisfied with what they say, they will ask the civil court for an order. So they just don't bother because they know that if, if they make a decision about, about assets, the, the losing party, so to speak, will just run to a civil court. Judges, for their part, understand th these are um, uh, legal judges. I mean, under, they understand that the councils make no civil law claims. Furthermore, judges may accept mediations as providing one among several bases for their own rulings. Mahar is a matter of contract. Despite occasional media efforts to raise alarms about these councils, members of the legal community in Britain, by and large, treat their practices as reasonable ways of mediating conflicts. So, so the, the, legal, the legal community sees this as uh, mediations, which can be useful, and they will take account of the results of these mediations when they may make their own legal decisions. The most visible statement of this position came in early 2008, when the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, argued that the courts needed to, quote, recognize Sharia on grounds that when Muslims resolve matters by drawing on their own norms, and as long as the outcome did not conflict with prevailing laws, they were only doing what members of other faith communities regularly did. He continued by arguing against an appeal to a single values framework as the basis for a society, claiming instead, quote, that our social identities are not constituted by one exclusive set of relations or mode of belonging, end of quote, but they come from many moral communities. All right, so all this, all this way of looking at the matter contrasts sharply to my earlier work in France. So we turn to a very different uh, context. France is the country of immigration par excellence in Western Europe, with about one quarter of its residents having at least one immigrant grandparent. Many politicians were born outside the country, including a mayor of Paris and a former prime minister, Manuel Valls, although his strident anti-immigrant rhetoric suggests that he may have forgotten that fact. There's, there's Valls visiting Angela Merkel in Germany. Uh, uh, leave, get out of here. You're not, you're not uh, in your own home. Hey, no, you, you, neither are you, Manuel. So reminding, he, reminding the prime minister that he too is an immigrant, says uh, Angela Merkel. As for Britain, France's immigrant workers who came during the post-war boom years were from former colonies. Um, there you are. They also included large numbers of Muslims and as with Britain, their presence led to their rejection both as black people and as Muslims. As anti-immigrant and racist attitudes took on stronger anti-Europe dimensions in Britain, especially with the rise of, of UKIP, these observers noted the resemblance in attitudes across the channel. So down with Europe and immigrants, finally, they resemble us, as you see on the French side. We should note, however, that for many years, the largest group of foreign residents in France, in fact, has been from Portugal. This goes unnoticed because of phenotypical resemblances and, and similarities, overlaps in religion. Now let's return to the three variables that I, I used in looking at Britain. First of all, migration trajectories. In the early post-war years, the French state and industries worked hand in hand to recruit workers, especially from Algeria, and to settle them near factories. These initial settlements were more mixed demographically, uh, compared to the British case, is many, mainly because of the lesser role of chain migration. It, these were direct recruitments. Turks and people from the Senegal River, River Valley have settled in ways in France in ways that more closely resembled the English pattern. Subsequent moves to large housing complexes, what are called the HLM, or, or uh, basically subsidized housing, further mixed up the populations. This is one of these HLM. Subsequent moves to larger, uh, sorry, um, recent comparative studies show a much lower degree of concentration by origins in France than in Britain. This difference makes less likely the rise of community institutions based on specific religious, ethnic, or geographic background. Okay, so a spreading out of people from different origins across different places of residence in, in France means that you don't have the same kind of ethnic or religion-based communities that you find in Britain. Second, um, the second variable, opportunities and constraints. What is encouraged and what is discouraged in countries of new settlement? The French political and legal context 
prevents the development of any Islamic legal or paralegal institution, such as have developed in Britain. French republicanism is hostile to intervening institutions in general, intervening between the state and the people. And the idea of Islamic law taking hold is shocking to anyone in France. At the end of a December 2008 French television program on the dangers posed by increasing religious influence on European politics, the narrator asked, where will this all lead? The answer was to show footage from the Islamic Sharia Council that we just looked at, where the music and the long beard on the scholar, the same one that you saw a minute ago, were chosen to scare the audience. The message was, if we go down this path, we will end, we will end up like Britain, where imams rule society. The French historical starting point is, of course, not community control and private arrangements, as in Rowan Williams's argument about England, but a Republican set of theories and assumptions about state institutions, that the state institutions provide the best ways to construct a society. The state can channel shared ideals and values back to its citizens. That's the theory. More particularly, religion was the main obstacle to the Republic. And over the past century, laws were passed to keep religion out of the public sphere, most notably the law of 1905 that, that uh, pushed, the, the, uh, pushed the church out of public affairs, as you see in this painting. Marriage and divorce in France are considered to be public things, shows public, in the French civil law tradition, not matters of private contract. And thus the idea of contracts constituting part of the marriage that we saw in Britain makes no French legal sense. Furthermore, many in France see Islamic marriages as a way of refusing to fully enter into the common life that bonds, binds citizens together. Marrying people Islamically who have not married at City Hall can land imam in jail. In 2010, two ministers sought ways to remove the French nationality of a man on grounds that although married legally to only one wife, he had married in Islamic fashion to others. The man in question replied that if having a mistress means you're thrown out of France, the government would soon be a few ministers short of a cabinet. So what then do Islamic institutions look like in France? Take mosques and recall that in Britain, mosques can often be major institutions with broad portfolios with strong ties to an ethnically or religiously specific local population, as well as to mosques and religious movements in South Asia. These characteristics are much less likely to be true of the French mosques serving the majority North African populations. Weaker communities, weaker community bases and mixed settlement patterns means that mosques rarely have missions and portfolios specific to one religious and ethnic community. An important exception to this would be the city of Marseille where settlement was much more likely to be ethnically specific. And so you do, you do find that sort of a mosque. For these reasons, mosques are most often of three types. First, with mosques, for mosques with ties to the state. This is the Paris mosque built in the 1920s as part of French foreign policy and French colonial policy. But you find these also in Lyon and, and Evry. These three uh, great mosques are, are, are considered to be, quote, privileged interlocutors with the state. It's sort of a subcontracting of, of governance. These are the three mosques allowed to certify halal sacrifices. More generally, the active role of the state is important to note here. For example, in the, in the Goutte d'Or, uh, in, in the north, north, north central part of Paris, prayers were commonly held in the streets. There was an insufficient uh, space in local prayer halls. And the minister, minister of the interior intervened using his police powers to uh, find a new hall for, um, uh, for, for prayer solved in a very top-down fashion. So that's one type of mosques, these, these large, very visible mosques that have strong ties to the state. Second kind of mosques are small, relatively improvised spaces. For example, in, in Clichy-sous-Bois, uh, here's, um, here's a housing complex, and you, know, you can play find the mosque here. You won't find it because it's the several apartments that were had the walls knocked down as a kind of improvised space for prayer. These are very common all over France, and especially in Paris. Um, they often have attached to them cultural centers that can be eligible for funding. The third type would be private purpose-built mosques that often try to blend in, sorry, often try to blend in with the environment. Visible differences are discouraged in France, hence the blending, but also for people. Headscarf affairs, and uh, I, won't, I won't go into it, but I, I wrote a book on, on the, the law, events leading up to the law of 1904 forbidding headscarves in public schools. Um, but also there's, there was a religious, a recent attempt to forbid girls under 18 from wearing a headscarf in public. That goes back to the, the debates. 
And this, uh, this law looks like it's going to be passed and it'll, it'll depend on what the state council says about it. So just, just to, to repeat this, this law would forbid girls under 18 from wearing a headscarf in public. That goes a, a bit further than previous legislation. But what about Islamic divorce? French Islamic public actors do not clamor for Sharia councils. Islamic repertoires, what are they? What ideas and practices have Islamic public actors brought with them? North Africans moving to France took with them ideas and habits about civil law forged in colonial experience and reinforced by post-colonial judicial reforms, particularly in Tunisia, from where, from where originate most major heads of Islamic institutions. This is uh, uh, Dao Miskin from Tunisia, who's one of these. He, he, he's he's, he's a, a, an imam. He's um, also started a school that I followed closely for many years, and he's been a constant object of attack from the, from the government because he's not part of the, the sort of main recognized uh, mosque system. These, uh, these Muslim uh, scholars assumed that marriage and divorce were public things, as had been the case in Tunisia, not contractual, and were matters for statutes and the judiciary. These ideas brought with them from, in this case, Tunisia, converged with French expectations, French state expectations, because they added up to a shared acknowledgement of the supremacy of state law. So uh, <clears throat> Dao Miskin once said to me, in Tunisia, when you're divorced, you're divorced, period. Although from time to time, there's no talk of two different divorces. Although from time to time, two uh, or more respected Islamic scholars might gather to dissolve a marriage, particularly among immigrants from West Africa, no institutions exist similar to the Islamic Sharia Council in Britain. But of course, women do find themselves in difficult marriages and do seek advice from scholars. One such scholar from Tunisia told me what he then does. I look into their marriage and try to calm things down, asking the husband to come and I see him too. If the husband refuses to divorce her, or if the wife brings witnesses about abuse, then I say to her, go to the civil court and get a divorce, and you will be doing nothing wrong in terms of religion. This is Dao Miskin uh, talking, the per person you see in the picture. I just say this on my own behalf. No one has authorized me to pronounce anything. It is psychological, assuring the woman that she's doing nothing wrong. If she asks me to write it down, I do so. I usually refer, refuse such requests, if I accepted all of them, I'd be no, doing nothing but that, but a few slip through. Other women either find other imams to do so, or they just go to the courts without trouble, troubling themselves further. So implicit in what he said is that there are a lot of women who have these demands with some sort of Islamic legitimacy to their civil court divorce, but mo many of them just end up going to the court. Furthermore, the potential cost of arguing for the creation of councils is higher in France than in Britain because of the strong French disapprobation of any intermediate religious institutions not under state control. This goes back to the, uh, the philosophy of republicanism, republicanism especially the, you know, of this Jacobin uh, variety. If you risk expulsion for voicing unpopular religious opinions or appearing with your wife in a full covering, which happens, you are hardly likely to campaign for creating Sharia councils. So, um, is there a positive outcome to this rather repressive picture? Rethinking uh, ways of adapting Islamic norms to these constraints is what then this generates. If in Britain, it is easier to establish Islamic institutions, that ease has also facilitated a degree of conservatism. Just do what you did in South Asia. And hence these continued uh, reliance on scholars from South Asia. But French public actors urge Muslim men and women to use the available civil institutions for marriage and divorce saying that French courts already do all that Muslims need in this regard. Another prominent scholar from Tunisia was surprised to hear from me that in Britain, women wanted to have separate religious divorces. As for him, a judicial divorce takes care of the matter. Indeed, he argued that Muslims should consider the civil marriage to, at City Hall to be required on Islamic divorce, for Islamic divorce. This is uh, from Hisham al Arafah, who founded a major uh, French uh, uh, university level school in Paris. I quote him. Some people think that having to go to City Hall and fill out forms is too much work. And moreover, they consider marriage to be a religious matter. And they do so all the more because some Islamic authorities say that marriage is religious. They say that the prophet in his time did not have laws about registering marriage, so it is not necessary for Muslims to do so. But then you can say, and this may, may make you laugh, but there's something to it, that back then the society was composed of tribes. And if someone married, he, he would never just leave his spouse because his life would be in danger. Everyone knew each other then. 
So there was no need for these regulations, but now it is different. That is reasoning according to the purposes in the Chassid of scripture. Marrying, so this is from Hishima Arafa, marrying in city hall is thus indicated by scripture, required by scripture, because scripture's passage on marriage, passages on marriage have as their purpose to make marriage a stable contract. The imam's account is a pragmatic one because France lacks the religious judicial institutions that could apply a religious divorce. A woman should ensure her future ability to free herself from unsuccessful marriage by marrying in civil fashion. The state not only provides legal force to preserve the marriage, but also provides the mechanism to leave the marriage that in other societies might be provided by an Islamic judge. Now, there are a lot of differences between Britain and France. I've mentioned some of them here. Another is the great, greater emotional charge, decolonization in France, due in large part to the brutality of the Algeri Algerian war. What would a broader comparative framework look like? But let me make a brief mention of Norway. This is the central mosque in Oslo. Norway is among the northern countries where immigration by Muslims has not been tied to colonial histories, where the most rapid growth has been relatively recently, and which have a widely varying portfolio of sending countries, in part because a higher percentage of Muslim immigrants come as seekers of asylum or, or, or of refugee status. Pakistanis, Somalis, Iraqis, and a smaller number of Turks are the major components of a smaller Muslim population than in the other countries we've looked at, Britain and France. Pakistanis are the best established populations in Norway with the long, longest history of adapting Islamic thinking and building religious institutions. But they contrast with Pakistanis in Britain because a different set of opportunities and constraints has both restricted the development of new institutions such as Sharia councils and brought to fore Islamic interpretations that would, give, that would work given those constraints. So as in, as in France, you, 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 you tailor your uh, Islamic reasoning to the, the possibilities and constraints in the, of the country you're in. I've not done any real field work in Norway, but I've interviewed a number of Islamic public actors about these issues. And so this is just a brief third case, but I'm not a, I'm not a Norwegianist by any means. The Norwegian state requires all mosques to register any Islamic marriage they perform, thereby making it a legal marriage. The rules grew out of a series of accusations that Muslims would set up a parallel legal system and would, and would infringe on the rights of women. As the imam of the Rabita mosque told me, quote, people often just come for the nikah because they want, that's the Islamic marriage, because they want to make sex halal, like civil partnerships. We turn them down, although we send them to other imams who perform the nikah in private homes, close quote. The opportunity structure in Norway thus accentuates the split between public registered marriage on the one hand and private un unregistered ones on the other. What about divorces? If a couple carries out a legal divorce, the mosque where they had married receives a copy of the divorce papers. What happens next is interesting for our questions about adaptation. The mosque initiates its own procedure of dissolving the marriage on Islamic grounds. And like the London Islamic Sharia Council, sends a letter to the husband saying that. But the Norwegian letter asks the husband to agree to the divorce by return mail. If he does not, which often happens, then the divorce automatically goes through. This procedure is in effect a quiet, non-visible equivalent to a Sharia council. As one Isla Islamic scholar explained it, in this case, the Norwegian state is acting in the role of the Islamic judge and dissolving the marriage when the man refuses to do so. As Islamic justification for this practice, they rely on a fatwa given by Faisal Malawi, a well-known scholar whose opinions are attended to in many parts of Europe. Malawi's fatwa is interpreted by the Norwegian actors to say that civil divorce counts as Islamic divorce. The imam I was interviewing then added, quote, we abide by the law, close quote. Of course, I had not suggested otherwise, but others had made that suggestion or that accusation. Contrast of Norway and Britain shows how distinct structures of opportunity and constraint shape both practices and interpretations for the same immigrant population, Pakistanis. From a broader Islamic perspective, this is not surprising as for centuries and across the world, Islamic public actors have shaped and reshaped ways of thinking and living Islam to local, social, political, and cultural patterns. What these examples tell us is that across Western Europe, and we could of course extend this analysis to other parts of the world, complex interactions among migration trajectories, national opportunities and constraints, and actors' Islamic repertoires shape what at least some Muslims do and think. We can look at this complex shaping process in micro, micro interactions, though I have done little of that in this talk. I do write a good deal about them in my relevant books as well as in broader, roughly national, socio-political patterns. 
Indeed, much of public policies concerning Islam draw on earlier policies regarding other religious groups, as well as, where it is relevant, earlier policies of colonial governance. We're always in a post-colonial world. In discussion, I would welcome further extensions of this model, for example, concerning situations in Germany or the American Congregationalist model or the geography of marriage in, in any one of a number of countries. In my, own in my own current work, I'm starting to extend the, the approach to other countries and take the shape of practices and services surrounding halal products as a starting point. Our comparative work has just begun, but the importance of changing the conversation in public debate is now more necessary than ever. Muslims as creative and adaptive participants in the never ending projects of building Western liberal democracies. Thank you very much. There, we're back to normal, normal Zoom life. Now that you need to unmute yourself. Now that you're, on, you're, uh, you're muted. Yeah. I'm muted. Okay. Um, thank it's you good. for the end. Th um, thank you for your very interesting presentation um, and the comparisons. Um, all right. Um, now I think we, we come to the uh, section of the discussion of your presentation. And I advise everybody who is interested to participate to send their questions in the Q&A. Uh, or F and A in German, where I'll pull these questions and ask them on your behalf, and then uh, John will respond to them accordingly. Um, to uh, to create some uh, time, um, I will first. I will uh, I will ask the first questions whether you think that religious um, accommodation in Britain and France, which just seems to be vastly different, especially. Uh, in civic societies and how Muslims deal with it um, could be a leading factor or predict, pre predictor in uh, whether those uh, um, populations tend to radicalize or not, mm. um, whether there is um, processes of co-radicalizations between um, in societies where there's a hostile environment towards uh, Muslim legal practice or not, where people tend to feel uh, unwelcome and therefore form radical uh, thought, or whether the exact opposite is the case where uh, countries are stricter, they seem to um, assimilate as arbitrary as it sounds like. Right, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna have a satisfa satisfactory answer to it because I've not studied it. It might be that other factors become even more important, thinking in particular of the, the colonial histories and their, and their legacies and particular characteristics of the, of the immigrant populations. Um, it's certainly uh, the case that Britain and France uh, share one thing, which is that they, they do have uh, extensive webs of institutions that, where Muslims are leading these institutions. And they do, they do have a great deal of share uh, of a stake in the society. Of course, they're, as I pointed out, they're so different in other ways. They're much more sort of uh, ground up civil society organizations in Britain, whereas in France, you have the greater, the greater weight of the, uh, of the state initiated structures, but there, but there are there are developed institutions uh, of different sorts, and um, so this may actually be important in in providing for Muslims a sense that they do have a stake in the in the, in the national system. There are institutions they can work within. But this is just guessing on my part. I really don't have any, I, I don't have any uh, particular knowledge of either of the, the you know the rates of radicalization, in across different countries, um, and and what de and what determines these. But I think that I think there are other factors that would have to be brought in beyond the ones I've talked about. All right, thank you. Um, okay, then my, my next question then would be, before I invite my uh, colleagues, is, um, I mean, you have shown, especially in the British case, um, uh, South and Southeast Asian communities in the like Birmingham area, Midlands, and uh, Southern, um, Southern England, well, we're talking about London and Greater London and Essex. Um, are there, when we talk about local adaptations, are there local adaptations that go so far as to local adaptations within a national container? For example, is the uh, Pakistani community or the Muslim community of Pakistani origin uh, organized differently in, around the Birmingham area as they are in Greater London, for example? Yeah, yeah. So um, my first, my first thought here, 
is is to contrast uh, so Leicester, for example, in the Midlands, with uh, with with Greater London or with Birmingham. But that would all in part also be because there 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 are different immigration histories regarding Leicester. That's that's again in 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 the Midlands area on the one hand and and London or Birmingham on the other. So Leicester is very interesting because there's a very uh, uh, tight community of people who. That, who came from uh, from 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 uh, from South Asia, from from Gujarat, in fact, specifically, many of whom then went to East Africa. They were engaged in trade and commerce, and from East Africa, they were they were kicked out by Idi Amin, and eventually, uh, most of them left other countries in East Africa and moved to Britain. And eventually, many of them had a secondary move within Britain to Leicester, where there are some streets that I've been on where every single person on the street. And I had a guy with me, obviously, I wouldn't have known this. Uh, had exactly the same history, so it's a it's a much much more speci much more specific uh, network of people with these exact same histories, but also with this uh, this interest and this experience and knowledge in commerce, and they become um, among other things uh, an essential part of what I'm studying now. These uh, halal certific certification bodies that uh, also center in this uh, Leicester-based community. That this is a very active, very very specific sort of. Um, uh, certification network where th there are such strong ties between certifiers and and producers of food who want to be certified as halal, all having this, all sharing the same background. With, then this background is transmitted to the, to the following generation. That th that they're extremely, um, uh, it's 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 unique. It's not at all sort of a certifying state agency versus a bunch of disorganized local local producers. Whereas uh, halal certification, in other parts of Britain or in other countries looks uh, quite different. There isn't anything like this network to fall back on. But that's just an example of how you can, you can have you know, sub, sub, uh, sub-national uh, uh, networks that have their own uh, specific properties. Let me just add, uh, I'll just mention it, but I can return to it if you're interested more or others are. My current work has been, um, has, it has taken me to the Netherlands uh, quite, quite a lot. I've done a lot of work there. And, and there it's a, a completely different sort of uh, set of of conditions, opportunities, and constraints from the other two countries, and they're especially uh, the the adaptation there has been especially to the the Dutch interest in in global commerce and global trade, uh, and much less interest in imp local implantation than in the British and French case. And also, uh, it's a case where their the Dutch particular the, the Netherlands own colonial history, with 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 respect to Indonesia, where I've I've done I did my first twenty years of work. Um, has very little to do with the people who are there now, the Muslims who are there now. So that, that means we're, who are largely from the same sources we've uh, been talking about uh, here. Um, and, and that means that there's a, there's a very different sort of history to uh, the formation of Muslim networks in, in the Netherlands. All right, thank you. We will head over to the next question um, by Professor Dr. Naika Furutan um, to the background of her question. Um, we are, um, I mean, of course, this is, this is hosted by the German Center for Integration and Migration Studies, but we as a group who are um, offering this, um, this workshop series, uh, we are the Islam Research Project, uh, which is the uh, German Islam as an alternative to Islamism, responses to Islamist threats in Muslim communities, associations, and contexts. We are funded by the Federal Ministry of uh, Education and Research and are part of uh, the RADIS joint project, which is, which is the societal causes and effects of radical Islam in Germany and Europe. And um, uh, Naika Furutan is the director of that uh, research group and uh, Özgür Özvatan is the co-director. And uh, Naika is asking, uh, well, whether saying, thank you, John, for your great talk. Could you elaborate maybe a little bit more on the difference between France and the UK concerning data collection? France has the idea of non-collection of ethnic data, and the UK is more and more uh, into smaller group categorizations. What do you think about both concepts uh, of data collection processes? Wow. Well, um, yeah, I, may, maybe um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the interest of the of, of the questioner comes from. Is about sort of normative questions about privacy, or is it more of a sociological question about what this means for the kind of knowledge we can have about the two countries? Um, maybe I'll take the second, assuming that it's that, rather than the ethical question for the moment, although we could come back to that. <clears throat> yeah, well, this affects, of course, um, 
the you know I mean it's it's quite interesting. There's 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 a formal uh, strong dis disapproval. The 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 questions assumptions are absolutely right. There's a strong state uh, disapproval of anything official that would distinguish people by ethnic or racial characteristics or even origins. Nonetheless, people talk about this all the time, and <clears throat> indeed they they talk in informal ways about what part of Algeria somebody came from, whether they're of Arabic uh, background or Berber background. The Berbers were given somewhat privileged status in French colonial policy. And this carries over to, to perceptions today in France, you know, in terms of those specific origins within a country. So there's, the, and, and officials uh, know about these things too. And so there's, there's often talk about that, and, um, but it, it doesn't show up in, in data collection uh, practices. That's, a, that's absolutely right. Um, I don't know about what sorts of effects this has on the institutions themselves. I, I don't know that there's very much, it certainly affects what we can say about um, uh, uh, immigration histories in these two countries based only on official data. And it, it just emphasizes the importance of having you know, more sort of um, on the ground approaches, ethnographic approaches, uh, historical approaches, so that we can, uh, we can, we can go beyond uh, the uh, kinds of information we get from official data. I'm not, I'm not sure if that uh, speaks to the interest of the, the questioner. Uh, please follow up if it doesn't. Yeah, we can we can all wait uh, until we have more feedback in the chat, I guess. But um, my my question, in addition to that, is whether um, you think or assess on the sociological level. Um, I mean, yeah, groundwork is one uh, good thing, but maybe being aware of like general general societies or population metrics whether um, it's actually hindering um, progress, for example, in France, if certain uh, um, developments cannot be um, further differentiated um, to ethnic components when we do not have the data for it. Like, uh, if that could pose a problem to uh, addressing those communities as we do not have certain viable metrics to um, assess or evaluate certain societal phenomena in those communities. Did you have something specific in mind or did you just want to pose it to me as a general question? Yeah, as a general question, what do you think? Yeah. That, that I don't happened? know, I mean, it, that, no, it's an interesting question. I, I, my, my immediate sort of visceral reaction, bodily, bodily reaction was, uh, boy, the last thing I would want to, to promote or to champion would be uh, uh, trying to uh, point a finger, the, the French state pointing a finger at certain ethnic groups as being more likely to be rat to be radicalized than others, uh, that's that's, I, that's that's not a good step to take at all. Uh, and you know, if I if I were you know, adopting the, the the position of um, a proponent of the French attitude towards all this, I would say that you know, for, for citizens or permanent residents in France, you have to treat people as individual as individuals, and 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 especially with respect to accusations of violent action or illegal action, and 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 try to discourage any kinds of generalizations about. What people do, because those are the bases for racism, and there's there's you know there's certainly enough racism already without having uh, kind of uh, these ethnic associations of likelihood to engage in terrorist activities uh, be added to them. So I, um, yeah, I'm I'm quite ambivalent about that. I'm not necessarily a, a champion of um, uh, making the public discussion uh, rest on generalizations about different groups. You know, if I can just draw a comparison to the United States, you know, very often people will say, well, take the example of uh, susceptibility to certain sorts of illnesses. People will say, well, uh, in, the, in the US, uh, Blacks have a twice as uh, high a, a, ch a chance, a likelihood of having certain sorts of diseases than, than do whites. And that runs the risk. It's certainly true, uh, and it certainly points to the history of racism, and especially with respect to housing, where you can live. Uh, that uh, is behind those sorts of differences, but it um, it's um, it can be dangerous if it prevents us from from looking at, at the fact the, the factors and the mechanisms involved. It may be that, in fact, if you look at black people and white people of the same income, there's no difference. But the the the, the difference comes from uh, your ability to have access to good health care uh, at a, at a reasonable cost to you. And always talking about things in terms of black and white differences could make it sound to some people uh, as if it's there's something biologically different about blacks and whites that makes them, it, it causes this, which could accentuate 
uh, you know, racialist ways of thinking. So th these questions are very complicated in terms of the consequences of foregrounding certain categories or not. All right. Um, next in line is our colleague Özgür Özvatan with uh, his question. He cannot use the Q&A, unfortunately, so he will speak next. Yeah, thanks so much for this great uh, presentation and the comparison. I found it really um, insightful. I cannot tell how insightful I found it, actually. I have like two, uh, two questions coming up uh, regarding your presentation. Um, the first one is, I mean, you 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 presented the the, the comparison and the very um, specific national um, restrictions and opportunities uh, you, you presented, and I was wondering now about the takeaway message from that. You, you know, we 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 observe on an empirical level that um, that Muslim civic life, community work, is different according to 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 national. Um, let's say political, say social political environments. But at the end, and this is this also you 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 mentioned that at some point, um, we see that um, Islam is um, very wherever it emerges is um, it seems to be highly adaptive uh, to to national contexts. So I was wondering whether um, there is also some something European in that. Right, because you, you you're comparing uh, European uh, uh, national Islams, uh, the French one, the the, the 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 British one, and then the the, the one from Norway. Um, I mean, you know, if we would be very strict and 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 political science oriented, we would say that they are not part of the EU uh, 27, 26. Um, right. However, however, um, uh, speaking of continental Europe as a cultural space. Um, I would, uh, I would, uh, I'm wondering whether there is something uh, European in that, because the topics that came up, like the practices might have been different, but the topics that came up seem to be uh, um, um, comparable, right? It was about divorce, about very, uh, very, um, um, uh, but about things that concern our uh, um, daily lives, right? Um, so I was wondering whether there is something European in that, uh, whether we can observe something uh, uh, very specific to Europe. I mean, he was not here no. the last hour, but <laughs> I'm talking now. He had to go, of course. <laughs> of course, uh, of course. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so that's the first <laughs> question. That's the first question. Uh, the, the second question I'd like to pose. No, I can you Um So and the second uh, question I'd like to pose regards um, the um, whether there is uh, there is a transfer to the online world about uh, uh, let's say for instance the, the the Sharia councils whether there is something you observe that um, you know speaking more to the younger generation whether it, it's some parts of it uh, uh, you observe moving to to the online world um, in, in, in these kind of uh, decision finding uh, processes. Yeah, right. So those are great questions, both of them. Uh, as to the first, is there something specifically European ab about this? Uh, my, my, my choice of, of contrasting two or three or four European countries is, is basically to sort of, um, in some sense, control for that uh, and to look at, uh, for all their differences, Britain and France have, you know, they're, 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 they're frenemies. They both have, they both had extensive colonial experiences, as did the Netherlands. And so the, um, trying to sort of do a control comparison, it's, it's a phrase I like very much, control for as much as possible. So you've got colonial, you know, uh, countries with the colonial pasts, uh, extensive international ties, and, and uh, large numbers of Muslims relative to the population, in, in, in many cases from the same place. So, so uh, from South Asia to a number of countries, it, Turks and a number, uh, number of countries. Indeed, Turk, Turkish Turkish comparisons will be, be great if we had more of those, because there you could, you've got, you, ha you have, relatively sizable populations of Turks in lots of European countries. So, so that's the first part of my answer is, um, uh, is the advantage of taking a, Euro a Western European uh, context and limiting myself to that is that uh, it makes it a, a little more, a little easier to identify the variables that seem to make a difference. Now, but I'm not sure that means there's anything specific about uh, a European country vis-a-vis -vis, say the US or Canada. Uh, the same issues arise 
um, of course, in terms of um, what sorts of institutions you can create to affect a divorce, what sorts of marriages can be recognized, in what ways. And indeed, the histories are somewhat similar. And we, we shouldn't forget that, that there's a, in all of these countries, say the US and Britain and France and, and others in Europe, there's a history of uh, thinking about these issues in terms of Jewish population, but also where similar issues come up. You know, what, what do you do with a get, a Jewish divorce? Does that have legal consequences or not, uh, et cetera? And, and these, are, these, are, these are really transnational questions, but they, they get dealt with in, in very different ways. Um, the, the adding the U.S. May, makes uh, complicates things a little bit in that you've got, of course, state law often rather than rather than national law being the relevant uh, legal legal forum, and so it's it's interesting to do cross state comparisons within that country, um, and then the sort of you know colonial history, uh, immigration histories are, are are really quite different. So I would say it's not I don't, I'm not sure it's something specific to Europe as it is that there are certain aspects to certain countries in Europe that are allow for overlaps, which it, looking at the US or Canada, just to start with those two countries, are, are so different that it would make the comparisons in some way maybe less interesting. Um, in, unless you, know, you were to focus on very specific legal issues such as you know, re religious divorces, and, and, then, and then we could extend the comparison. So it's, it's a tactical uh, uh, question, really. You know, how broad do you want to go um, in, these, in these contrasts? But, so for the moment, my answer to the question is, I'm not sure there's any, anything specific about Europe or the EU. I think it's probably these other uh, issues of, of the post-colonial uh, nature of or dimensions of migration that affect some of the European countries in ways that don't affect others. Um, Italy is going to be very, very different again. Uh, I'd had a student working there. And the US is going to be very different also. So anyway, this, the, second que the, the second question, um, Sorry, I forgot. No, oh yeah, online, right? Uh, yes, of course. There's a tremendous for for a long time now. There's been a tremendous uh, recourse to to various kinds of authorities on the, on the, on on online, and this has has all sorts of effects. Of course, it it means that uh, uh, people let's let's say let's say women looking for answers to questions about divorce. Just to take that example, as we were talking about. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that many, many uh, women will do if they're not finding local satisfactory answers to their uh, felt need to have an, an Islamic divorce in France, for example, is to go online and, and ask to sort of look for somebody who will give them what they might think of as the right answer, whatever that is. So there's forum shopping often in terms of what they're really looking for, or I would say and at the same time, there is a sense of, uh, you know, the, the gulf has greater authenticity. So my, my, my local imam is, you know, he's an immigrant, he's from Tunisia, for example. Learned though he may be, isn't it, wouldn't it be better to go to um, authorities in, in Saudi Arabia? Wouldn't they be closer to the true meaning of Islam, something like that? And that, that sort of uh, idea, I think, has been driving a lot of people for, for a long time. Of course, there's problems in that because one of the, one of the, one of the really uh, admirable things, I think, about some of these Islamic institutions in their ability to adapt is is their, their, their strong sense um, of, of the need to take into account the specific situations of the individual where she or he lives. So the, Islam, the Islamic Sharia Council of London spends most of its time looking into uh, the particularities of each case, of each request, and you know, knowing something about the context of the two parties, uh, calling in the husband to see if, if what the wife said was true, uh, looking for proof of this or that. And of course, that's, that's, um, that's what that's what courts and, and councils and mediation services do and should do. You're not going to find that on a, a sort of a web, looking for an answer on a web sort of thing. But yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And uh, I, I don't know yet whether we've got attempts to do something as personalized as what councils do on, on, the, on the internet that, that, that may very well be here or, or coming soon. But uh, what, what one of the, the consequences will be is that, is, is that it, it takes the person out of the local context and, and puts her or him into this, um, this international one where the assumption that authority lies in the Gulf is, uh, uh, I think, isn't necessarily always a beneficial assumption to make. Interesting. Um, okay, are there any more questions in the audience?
Okay, then let me see. Okay. Uh, Gian asks or says, thank you very much for your input. My question relates to the connection between political support for Muslim life and the formation of an Islam adapted, adapted to national context. Do you see from your research a direct connection between the political facilitation of Islamic life and the formation of a specific uh, Islam? Or is it the other way around? Is it that rather that the political impediment to the living of Islamic tradition that leads to a creative adaptation of Islam to circumventing, yeah, circumventing uh, these obstacles? Yeah, well, um, I think both are, both are important, but my, my emphasis has been on the second of those two options, I think, the ways in which, because there's a, there's a sequence here, there, the, the, the basic sorts of structures of opportunity and constraint are already there in these countries, and, you know, in a very, very, again, it's not that it never changes, but in a very uh, simplistic maybe way, Britain and France are quite different in terms of, the, in terms of those structures. And when immigrants arrive, including uh, scholars um, about Islam, they're, they're faced with the question, how do I deal with this? And so, but which isn't, isn't entirely pragmatic and tactical. It's also the case, as I, as I suggested, that the, the colonial history matters. So that because the immigrants, including scholars coming to France are from largely from um, uh, uh, former colonies, they bring with them, the scholars bring with them a way of looking at the world, which is already marked by, Fran by France. And so it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not a sort of forced a turnabout, right? To, to say that, that there's, there's the state and, and, and marriage is a public thing. And once you're, once you're divorced, you're divorced, period. The sorts of things I found from French imams. They're already quite uh, uh, well along in thinking about that. What happens in, the, in, the, in, in France in this case, is, is there's, there's more pressure to have a kind of a wholesale rethinking of how we justify the particular choices that we scholars are making. And here's where you get the creativity uh, and the inventiveness in terms of things like using uh, the, the general interest um, um, as, a, as, a, as an important legal category, uh, which you see across uh, the board in, uh, in France, especially as compared to Britain. So, because this allows you then to, to take things out of their particular uh, Jurisprudential context. So there's there, there's both this kind of, you know, arriving in France or Britain or, or elsewhere, having to, you know, being forced to adapt. There's that. And then there's also uh, sort of these, the state responding in terms of how it treats this new population. And uh, and as a, you know, whether 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 it feels that it ought to treat them as similar to other religious populations or ought to simply ignore the existence of a religious community uh, qua community and not give it any sort of legal recognition, which would basically be the difference between Britain and France. I hope uh, that satisfies your question, Gian. If not, you are welcome to um, just uh, hang in there and ask another question if you want to. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, uh, Thomas uh, Viskirchen is writing us during your presentation on Britain, you refer to the idea that it may not be necessary for all groups of society to follow the same norms in all aspects of social life. And how far do you think this is a practical approach to the rule of law and liberal democracies? Right. Well, that, is, that of course, is a broad question in political theory that uh, you know, divides people who are more communitarian from people who are more uh, let's say, um, uh, universalistic, someone like John Rawls, for example, versus someone like Bill Kimlicka, just to think of North American political theorists in terms of how much um, normative uh, leeway is given to specific community norms. You know, that's a, it's a huge question. There isn't, I don't know how important my opinion is, but I thought about it quite a lot. And of course, um, there, there are points where uh, each society, I mean, each society and then groups of societies coming together in various sorts of international treaties and United Nations, et cetera, but at least each society has, uh, you know, makes certain sorts of decisions about what's allowed and what's not allowed. And a great example of this is, is gender equality. There's a strong commitment to gender equality uh, in, in both in France and, and in, in, uh, in Britain and, in, of course, in Germany and other countries as well. And then the interesting question becomes not uh, does everybody has, ha have to uh, subscribe to that, but rather how do we interpret gender equality? And the arguments there are can we have how much gender asymmetry can we have? Uh, versus uh, versus a real um, generous uh, allowing recognizing a, what is a kind of public gender asymmetry 
rather than looking at the effects, the outcomes. And here, this is the, so this is something where the Islamic Sharia Council struggles uh, quite often between members of that council who would say, well, look, we have to give, um, uh, we have to interpret the law in, in such a way as to give equal voice to men and women. Uh, but we have to also work with the texts and, and uh, legal traditions of, of, of Islam. How do we sort of balance these things? And here's where, by the way, if I may, if I may just add on, um, I found my work in Indonesia useful for thinking about the whole range of possibilities. And I did work a lot on, on marriage and divorce in Indonesia over the years, especially in Aceh, which is a province which is um, uh, self-Islamized self uh, in, in the legal system as much as possible. And there, there was a concerted effort to uh, try to make the uh, two kinds of divorce, one initiated by a man versus one initiated by a woman as, 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 uh, as similar as possible, as equal as possible, by, by, change, by moving from Arabic names, uh, Talak and Hula, to Indonesian names, which made them sound like their equivalent processes, to trying to work out ways to make sure that the, uh, the, an estate that's divided between a husband and a wife on divorce gets as much as possible equally divided between the two. And, and so it's very interesting to watch how there's this strong effort in Indonesia over many, many years, uh, longer than uh, some of these examples I've been talking about for Europe, to try to, to, try to equalize gender, uh, what women and men get in the Islamic state court system, because it is a state system in the Indonesian courts. Uh, so that's sort of a long-winded answer here that um, I think the most useful thing for us to do as social scientists or as observers is, is not sort of to say, well, this is, this is good, this is bad, but, but to appreciate and to acknowledge the sorts of activities, cre often creative activities of, of building new institutions and, and reinterpreting older uh, ideas about what Islam says or does not say in such a way as to make, make more and more equal the, the lives of men and women or of, of any two people in a, in a society. I think, I think by recording those efforts, by making public, the fact that people are making uh, strong, consistent efforts to move these practices in, in that direction of equality is something that uh, we have an obligation to, to make public, to communicate more broadly. And please come back at me on, on this one if, you, if you'd like to. Yeah, that, that, that holds true for everybody. Uh, whenever yeah. you want to hold in there and uh, pose a question again or reiterate or uh, discuss what have been uh, answered, um, go ahead and do it. We have a lot of time and a lot of space for this discussion. Um, now the next question or message comes from Sue Jaimo. Uh, she says, great talk, thank you. I have two questions. First, can you say more about the meaning of French republicanism? Is laicite distinct from that? And secondly, can you com comment on the new Islamic separatism law in France? Do you see it as an example that France is not, will not move toward a more tolerant approach towards religion? Yeah, yeah, great questions. Um, so republicanism is the older idea. Of course, it, it's, a <clears throat> it's the idea that came out of the French Revolution that um, the, in, in, in the Republic, everybody's equal and that the state has a role to to find and reflect in its activities the general will. This is very Rousseauian, the, 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 the general will of the people, and that there not be intervening institutions standing between the state, which in this, in this political theoretical view is, is universalistic, and the people whose wishes have to be translated into law. And inter inter intervening institutions like civil society kinds of institutions just get in the way of, of that. Very, you know, it's a very specific kind of political theory. Um, and uh, laicite, of course, and, and, and by the way, this, so this applied, you know, for a, a long time, well before laicite, which is a, uh, a, um, uh, a philosophy about what sorts of you know, recognition uh, the state ought to take of, of religious particularities. And, and that, of course, um, was, was always about, more than anything else, was always about schools. What sorts of um, schools can the state aid? What sorts of messages sh should the state uh, support? And Laicite was basically, uh, came, came, it's, it's an ever-changing kind of philosophy, but it's, it, it grew out of this, this movement at the very beginning of the 20th century to, to get the religion out of the business of educating young French women and men. So much more specific. It's, um, and, and, and of course, it's, it's gotten broad, broadened over the years. And specifically, <laughs> this, is, this is the second part of your question, uh, specifically with respect to Islam, it's, it is the 
references to ICT, which are sort of a sac sacrosanct uh, reference, you can say, well, in, in the interest of ICT, everyone's going to say, well, that's okay, that's a good starting point. No, nobody's going to question whether ICT is appropriate, although they might, they might wonder what's meant by this particular speaker, right? But um, it's taken as a kind of normative uh, caution or support <clears throat> or justification for uh, a lot of measures which uh, went far beyond the initial focus on schools and started saying much more about public life. So the, the ban on, so just a, a little bit of history very quickly, the, you know, the ban on religious signs, ostentatious religious signs in schools enacted in 2004 was uh, under the cover of, of being not particularly focused on Islam. Of course it was, because the only things affected by, the only garments or uh, things affected by this were headscarves on women that were deemed to be uh, intended to convey the, 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 the pupils' um, Islamic faith. And there, had, there was a very complicated process of the teachers trying to figure out what sorts of scarves signaled the sign, what sorts of, sorts of scarves did not. It's, it's absurd in many, way, in many ways, but motivated by the idea that in a public school classroom, there should not be any sort of uh, visible indication of anybody's <clears throat> religion. Uh, then it moved to the, uh, the burqa or the niqab, basically the idea of something that's covering the face. And, and there, there was this um, series of measures that led to the banning of wearing a burqa in public, so a full face covering. If you're a Muslim, if you're not a Muslim, of course, it, it isn't effective because you're not signaling your, your religious belief. And this, it's legally, I've often found, I found all of these things a little bit suspect. But <clears throat> um, and that applied to all of public life. So that um, a, a woman wearing a uh, full face covering, a Muslim woman, for example, could, could walk out of her house, which is private, get into a taxi, which is considered private, and be driven to the, the Pavi, the, the, the great esplanade in front of the, of, of the cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. And as long as she stepped out of the taxi onto the, the Pavi, which is part, as part of the cathedral, it was actually private, it's property of the cathedral, um, she was okay, but if she stepped on the ground first, then she was automatically in violation of this law uh, against wearing a full uh, face veil in, in public, and, which is again a little bit absurd. The new measure um, extended, to, extended uh, to girls under 18 uh, and the wearing of, of uh, an Islamic headscarf. So back to the idea that motivated the 2004 law about schools, but now for any sort of appearance in public. And, yeah, it's gotten it's gotten more and more uh, strict. It's um, uh, these are laws that are justified in terms of again uh, laicite, but now now more unity, national unity. And this is I think this is very dangerous. The, the assumption that signaling your Islamic faith is automatically taken as a sign of getting in the way of national unity. I think this is a terrible path to go down. But that's that's the context in which these things were uh, were, were couched in, in the past. Thank you for that elaborate and um, distinctive answer. Um, the next question comes from uh, Naika Fukutan again. She asked, Dear John, would you think that the same ascent of communities into political and societal power leads to more competition among them or rather to more alliances? Wow. So if I understand the, correct, the question correctly, it's uh, different. Uh, Muslim communities or, or, or different religious communities? I, I'm not sure what the focus is on here. Uh, I, 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 given the context, uh, Nika can, uh, uh, can reiterate if she wants to and thinks that my comprehension of the question is uh, incorrect, but um, the formation of uh, Muslim organizations and communities or uh, community-based organizations mm -hmm. um, revol revolving about Muslims and uh, Islam, um, the more they ascend into like political society, uh, societal power, does that mean that the uh, competition arises between those uh, um, organizations or any like um, uh, yeah, community bodies, or do they tend to form alliances if they uh, do participate in uh, those kind of uh, discourses? Right, right. That's that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I see I see the rise of the, these all these diverse organizations you have in Germany and one finds in France and Britain as well, uh, reflect the diversity of the Muslim populations. 
you've got you know worldwide movements, the, the, the Tablik Jama'at, uh, Miligurush, and others, uh, which reflect very specific backgrounds and interests and, and attract uh, different followers. But in the civil society contexts, legal and social contexts of Europe, there's no reason why they can't attract uh, people who don't have that same background. Uh, I think, I mean, my personal view is the translation of these, uh, these all these different organizations into uh, into um, locally acceptable. I mean, I mean, really legally and politically acceptable uh, associations, which is the case in France, even as well as the other countries, is a very good thing because it gives people a stake in public life. And it, I think the competition is, is 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 good. I'm not sure that competition is the main thing that happens. Maybe it does. It would be a, it would be competition over certain resources. Maybe in the case of Germany, state subsidies might be an issue. Uh, that's less the case in the French and in German cases. Um, and at the same time, we should acknowledge that there are lots of efforts to have kind of cross uh, uh, cross community fora. So in, in in France, there's been a uh, an annual. Uh, Kind of big uh, Islamic fair almost held uh, outside of outside of Paris, where speakers from a number of different places and origins come together, and there's it's a place where lots of young Muslims like to go, and it's almost a, a way to hear different opinions on on Islam itself. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, it, so. It's it's often not it, it sometimes is competition, but it's also a kind of a uh, insertion into the local structure of associative life, which I think is is very helpful. In ways of incorporating, <coughs> excuse me, incorporating these, these different interests and different backgrounds into a, a national conversation. I, I, I think that's got to be positive. I hope that responds to the question. No, I, I like the answer of uh, um, Naika. Naika wants to, wants to chime in. She has every right and chance to. Of course. Um, Next question is by Sue again. Afterwards, I will uh, take Özgür into uh, the queue. And uh, Sue is asking, how do colonial leg le legacies fit into how host countries relate to Muslim immigrants? Well, uh, quite, quite a bit. Has, and and <clears throat> as it's part of my argument is that the particular colon colonial legacies taken, as a, taken broadly. So uh, I, I mentioned the for example, the case of the uh, uh, the groups from Leicester, who had this very very specific background, which is colonial in the sense that they came from a particular part of the British colonial world, Gujarat, and went to another area where where there was colonial rule in East Africa, and then it ended up in Britain. Um, that particular history, which is is in part colonial and post colonial, led to a very very specific, very strongly networked uh, interest in uh, in international commerce. So it it strongly affects. The institutions we find today, and those those individuals then assume a uh, a very large, high, again highly networked uh, 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 world in uh, in Britain itself. And by the way, the languages of origin are often then <coughs> transmitted as well. So Urdu becomes important for many of these people to learn, uh, even if they. So some we've got some second generation Muslims who have this share this Gujarati background, but they, they grew up not knowing anything but English, and so they have to learn Urdu to participate in some of the conversations. Going on in Britain, I don't know if there's an equivalent in, in France or Germany, but that, it really struck me as a one aspect of the very specific historical colonial nature of of, of this time of these ties in Britain. So yeah, I mean I, we could give, uh, give lots of examples, but that was that was in some ways the one of the major points of the talk is that yeah, it's a very strong impact on what what uh, social associative life, let's say most generally, is like for different Muslims in different European countries today. All right, if there's no um, immediate response to that, I would give the floor to Özgür for another question. Yeah, could, I, could, I, could I ask just a, a 30 second break to refill my water glass? Sure. sure. I'll, be right, I'll be right back. Don't worry about it.
All right, I'm back. Wonderful. Um, so let me start with the with the with a description first. I very much like the idea uh, um, of including um, including the Islamic repertoires as you as you call them as a key variable. And I, now I was wondering, uh, and that ties a bit to to Nika's uh, uh, question. Um, to the reception of, 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 of state support for certain or very specific Muslim communities, because you mentioned, you referred, you referred to some of them uh, stating that uh, some hold privileged status. So first of all, I would like to learn more about what that means and how that comes in, a, in, this, in, a, in this very secular context, what it means to be to have a um, privileged religious uh, status. Um, especially in light of the um, of the series of uh, Islamist att terror attacks in, in France, um, so um, who manages to to become that privileged status? Who doesn't? And how? What does that mean for for um, internal uh, internal um, competition? And then, of course, also for external comp competition among among religious minorities. Um, again, in light of the uh, uh, series of Islamist terror attacks in France, and also in light of uh, uh, laicite in, gen in, gen in general uh, in, in France, so a bit maybe on the uh, more on the privileged uh, status context, and also on maybe on the on the in the genealogy of these of these mosques and uh, what the concrete repertoires actually what their concrete uh, um, um, repertoires actually are like. What, what kind of ideologies, maybe ethno national backgrounds or positionalities they come from. Right, right. Well, yeah, that's um and, and this 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 does specifically affect or regard the, the case of France. <clears throat> um it, it's um one indication of the way is in which security uh drives a lot of this is that the 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 the, the body called the, the Islamic Bureau, the Bureau d'Islam, is um Part of the Ministry of the Interior, so there's a, it's it's a policing uh, role that the state has with respect to these these recognized mosques that goes back to colonial days. <clears throat> it's just a prolongation of that, and it starts with the Mosque of Paris, which was part of a colonial uh, part of France's efforts to uh, be recognized as legitimate Islamic power. It's a kind of a funny phrase given our association, <coughs> excuse me, of laicite. But uh, this notion of being a great Islamic power was something that was an important part of France's colonial enterprise. And having the Paris mosque sort of anchor the, the whole colonial enterprise link France to North Africa, especially to Algeria, was really critical. So the, the Paris mosque is, is it's an, it's an Algerian stronghold. And there's been a series of uh, leaders of it passing from father to son and, and within a, a very small circle. Um, and so it's, it, it, and then added to this were, a couple of other mosques in Lyon and, and Evry, which also uh, a little bit later on, but assume the same sorts of roles. And what are those roles? Well, they're, they're um, roles of mediation, uh, privileged status on the, um, on the government run, uh, consult was called a consultation under Nicolas Sarkozy who began this, but there's been a series of different uh, state uh, consultative groups, which don't really do that much, but give a sort of a, an air of legitimate legitimacy to those who are participating, and um, which includes various uh, movements as well, the Tablich and others. It's not just these, these mosques. Uh, the Mosque of Paris gets to say when the uh, fast starts uh, in, in Ramadan. Um, the, they, these, these three also had privileged status in terms of uh, having, their, uh, having a relationship to uh, slaughterhouses where they're, they're, the products of the slaughterhouses are recognized as halal, um, and in, in other sort of informal ways, they're the, they're the places that the government goes to to sort of uh, request that the mosque deal with the question locally. Um, you know, Sarkozy, Sarkozy's formation of the, of the consultation, the state body was, was really interesting. He just, he invited a bunch of these leaders to, to uh, uh, I think it was the palace and put them into a room and said, we're, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna stay here until we work this out. Uh, and so it was very, very state, very, very colonial in, in tenor and tone, <clears throat> and very much focused on having some kind of uh, legitimate mediators. And of course, what this means is that <clears throat> anybody else is considered to be potentially an enemy. 
So uh, I spent most of my time, I, I've, I've spent very little, very little time with these mosques over the years. I spent most of my time with uh, what I find to be more interesting, which were efforts of people who were not at all inside the state's sphere of activity. People like uh, uh, Skin, who you saw, who had who set up his own school, it was the first effort to set up a, <clears throat> uh, a, a French um, secondary school. It was called La Réussite, or Success. Uh, and out, outside the the sphere of of state state approval of or, yeah of state approval, and it got recognized as uh, counting as a as, as a school, and then, but it was constantly under attack by people, especially in the Ministry of the Interior, who saw uh, Dalmi Skin because he wasn't playing the game, the state's game, as as but somehow it, it really bothered them that he wasn't working with them, that he was trying to do things on his own. And uh, eventually led to the, you know, the decreasing population in the, in, the, in the school over time until it became not really viable. Uh, Hishima Arafa, who I also mentioned, the first to start uh, Islamic uh, kind of higher higher school or, or un university, although he didn't use that word really, <clears throat> is also somebody who was operating entirely on his own. Uh, he he played a kind of he played a more successful game with the authorities, um, but uh, he was never really considered to be, uh, you know. On, on the inside. So what this creates is this strong, is, is, a, is a potential to, to suspect people who aren't, uh, not, not a matter of being recognized, but aren't playing the state's game, aren't willing to be on the, 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 the consultation or the, the, the council in the, in the Ministry of the Interior. Um, and they then tend, the state works in many ways and, and they can bring certain sorts of pressures uh, like you know, constant inspections of, of premises, et cetera. To uh, to try to bring these these uh, schools to a to a halt. Dami Skin was even jailed for a while on suspicion of aiding terrorism, which wasn't true. He was he was freed fairly quickly. But uh, it's a constant harassment of people outside the system. Did, did I miss part of your question? Oh, did I, I got it. Okay, good. Yeah, I I love how your answers give more insight. Um, uh, additional insights to what we uh, were presented to, like we seem to zoom in on a lot of these aspects uh, further and further, and uh, that's only a uh, indication that um, people were stimulated by your presentations. And Good, that's great. Hence, I am um, taking in Sue's last question. Uh, she has already become uh, somewhat uh, um, self-conscious about her and uh, not meaning to monopolize the Q&A. Uh, you are definitely not monopolizing the Q&A. I still have the means of uh, power here, the means of production. <laughs> <laughs> the means of production I might have. You, you, are, you are the state. I am, I am the state. I have the monopoly of symbolic power here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, she asked, in my last question, I meant to ask how past uh, repression under colonial rule may shape host countries' reception of Muslim immigrants today. Is the discrimination that Muslims face only due to their religion or do the fraught history of uh, colonial rule? In other words, how well are the UK and, Fra uh, and France addressing the legacy legacies of their colonial history? This may be beyond the scope of your talk. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it is a very broad question, but again, as in your, your earlier questions, a very good one. <laughs> I think, um, you know, some of it, of course, is, is what I've uh, mentioned before in terms of institutional continuities, right? So that the, the the role that the Great Mosque of Paris plays now is a is a descendant, as it were, <clears throat> it's a follow on in the post colonial world of the role they played uh, in in France's um, colonial ventures in Algeria. Uh, that's that's very specific. Nothing is really quite like that at all in Britain. There's no sort of similarity because the governance structure was was very different. They were. <clears throat> they, there was it was it was you know in in the classic distinction that the British model was indirect rule, and the French model was direct rule, and the Dutch kind of went from one to the other. <clears throat> um, so that meant that there wasn't the same heritage in, in in Britain of having kind of recognized privileged mosques. That the mosques that became the the major mosques, like the ones some of the ones I showed you, uh, came out of a very different uh, genealogy, which was the uh, back and forth between the former colony and and Britain, but by uh, by Muslims themselves, by people who came from those areas themselves. In many cases, uh, through uh, ties of, of education, but but even more often trade and, and economic ties, 
And so the back and forth, just to sort of sum it up, you know, the, there, there, was, there was much more back and forth in the British case with the, uh, the ex, ex colony, uh, but not really driven by state, uh, state initiatives and not, not really shaping those state initiatives very much. Whereas in the French case, it was the other way around. It was very much more directly the descendant of colonial policies with um, not necessarily having a back and forth at all, but, but sort of taking what was an external a colonial method of, govern of governance through Islamic institutions and making it part of, of, of domestic control of, of Muslim institutions. So continuity in the, in the state's view of things in the French case, continuity of the, um, um, of the back and forth in the, uh, in the other case. I'm just looking on, okay. Uh, I have to go to another Zoom room at some point. You'll tell me when to do what, right? Yeah, of course. Um, I think, um... We had all questions um, posed in the uh, Q&A so far. I would uh -huh. then make a break and uh, would continue at quarter part six with the workshop with the um, invited guests and the project uh, participant um, if there is no, um, no reasons against that. All right. Then I uh, thank you, John, for your uh, presentation and being um, for being so uh, patient uh, with us and our very, very um, specific questions. Um, I hope, um, yeah, I hope we can continue this discussion uh, furthermore in the workshop at quarter past six. Um, um, the people invited will then enter um, step by step. There are students that will enter the workshop too, and thanks, thank, uh, thanks to all participants and uh, people who asked the questions. Um, it really helped uh, understanding the dynamics of uh, Islam and Muslim practices in France and Britain. And uh, see you next time, um, either in the workshop or the next uh, session with Nadia Marzuki. All right, see you at quarter past six. Thank you for your questions. <laughs>